Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. We have a good crowd today. Um, and hi to the Zillow offices in San Francisco, Orange County, Nebraska, New York, and elsewhere. Um, very excited about our speaker today. This is someone that I think a lot of you will, will learn some things from and hear some fun stories from. Uh, it's Rand Fishkin, who is the CEO, or as he likes to call it on the website, the wizard of Moz. Uh, Moz is a Seattle-based company that helps marketers with inbound channels like SEO and content and social media. Um, but Rand is sort of the all-knowing expert on SEO. He's written a book on it. He's been named one of Business Week's 30 best tech entrepreneurs under 30. Are you still? Yeah, are you still under 30? <laughs> You're looking good. Uh, one of the Puget Sound Business Journal's uh, 40 under 40 for the Seattle region. Um, and he describes himself as an addict of all things content and social on the web. He also has some really interesting stories about building his business from uh, being really just himself uh, many years ago into kind of the powerhouse it is today. So I'm excited to welcome Rand and we'll have some time for questions at the end. All right, so I'm gonna walk through a little bit of history. Uh, when we first started the company, it was, uh, I dropped out of college in 2001 uh, to join my mom's sort of fledgling uh, marketing consultancy. She'd been helping small local businesses with like business cards and letterhead and logos and that kind of like old school marketing pre the web. She had started that business in 1981 and it had just been her all the way through. Uh, and so in the late 90s, her, her clients started asking for websites and so of course, you know, her son in high school slash college uh, was where she went directly and I learned how to code a little bit and uh, how to design websites. Didn't, it didn't actually go very well, that, that whole dropping out of college, uh, doing a business thing. So this, as you can see right here, this is the uh, debt that we accrued over the next six years. Um, we, we were really bad at stuff, also at things. Um, just, it, 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 I had no concept of what a startup was. I didn't know what, uh, it meant to raise money. There was no, there, you know, there were no books like uh, the Lean Startup from Eric Ries. There was no community like a Hacker News. There was nothing like the entrepreneurship around technology that there is in Seattle uh, today. It was very, and and I was completely disconnected from any of that. Both of us were, and so we really had no idea what we were doing. We thought, oh, if we want to get good clients, we should get a really nice office space. That will help us to get clients. That number one. <laughs> Hey, we should hire some uh, developers. But we didn't, of course, know how to hire people. Debt number two. Oh, well, let's see. That's not working. Hey, let's do a bunch of advertising. Debt number three. Yeah, and none of that stuff worked. And so it wasn't really until we found uh, SEO. So I started doing some SEO kind of research and participating in forums in 2003 when our clients asked for uh, traffic to their websites. It was worse than that. They were like, well, you built us a website, but it's not getting any traffic, so we're not going to pay you. So I was like, how do, we, how do we get traffic without paying for anything? Quick, <laughs> SEO to the rescue. Uh, so in 2007, uh, we had actually paid up, I know, right? <laughs> it's unbelievable. So do you remember, do you guys know uh, the oatmeal here in Seattle, uh, Matt Inman? So he was, uh, he was our developer for four years. We hired him in uh, 2004. <laughs> I guess he left in 2007, so this, uh, it was about three and a half years. That was, uh, you can kind of see like the early indications of what Matt would eventually do uh, as, a, as a comic artist. Um, so he, you know, he designed a bunch, of these, a bunch of these tools. We launched this in 2007, February of 2007, and that, uh, that, that kind of took off. This, because we had built up a big, blog platform that a lot of people, a lot of people in the SEO world particularly were reading and subscribing to, participating in. Many, many of those folks uh, came to us and, and saw that we had a subscription. Once we turned on a subscription model, it started kind of taking off. Um, we did the reverse of what most classic startups today do, which is we built a marketing channel and then a product. And I've heard a lot of uh, discussion in Silicon Valley that this might actually be how people are now recommending you go because marketing is so incredibly challenging. 
At the end of 2007, we raised our first round of investment. That was from um, Adrian Hanauer, who's on your wall there, and Kelly Smith started a fund called Curious Office, um, and Michelle Goldberg from Ignition Partners. And funny story, actually, if you read all the articles about that fundraising, uh, it says that we raised 1.25 million, which we didn't. We were supposed to, but Curious Office uh, was going to put in 250,000. They only put in 100,000. And so I have been needling Kelly for the last few years. I'm like, I'm going to make that worth like 10 million. I'm going to make it worth 100 million. Like, you should have, you should have kept it in there. Um, so, which has been, which has been really fun. Uh, and I, I actually had written. <laughs> I'd written a lot about kind of our, our venture capital process. The first time Michelle reached out to me, it was over email, and I had this panic thing. I went home to Geraldine, who was my girlfriend, now my wife, who, by the way, during all this, this is how I paid my rent, right? I didn't buy anything. I had virtually no salary. I think I took home $800 a month sometimes. Um, and so, yeah, Geraldine paid my rent and, and all of that stuff, which is awesome. I highly recommend getting a a co-funder like that. Um, <laughs> the, so when Michelle reached out to me, I, I, I was really scared. I thought, okay, venture capital, that means they take over your company and kick you out, right? How do I stop this? <laughs> Just knew nothing about the, about the practice. Uh, we raised this money on the idea that, that, so Michelle came to me and she said, do you have an idea, like something that you really want to get done, something you've always wanted to do? And I said, yeah, I am furious with Google. Google claims that transparency is one of their core values, and yet they keep taking data away from the web. Right? So it used to be the case that if you put in you know, link colon Zillow.com, Google would show you all the links that they knew about to Zillow. Right? That was from uh, 1998 until 2004 they did that. And then in 2004, they made it so they only showed a sample of the links, which was very misleading and confusing, and no one knew where the sample came from, and they were very opaque about it. And then fast forward to 2007, and they actually took away the link command entirely. Um, Yahoo used to offer something called Yahoo Site Explorer, which would give you a lot of that link data. They took that away, too. Uh, Bing was the last holdout, and uh, their link command doesn't work anymore either. So there you go. So my, my, my quest was like, hey, I want to recover this data. I want people to be able to see into the link graph and understand how search engines work because they keep it making that practice more and more opaque. And I think that actually makes spam worse, not better, and makes it harder for good marketers to do their jobs. So there you go. We, have a, we built a web index. We actually built it in uh, about 10 months from conception uh, to construction, which a lot of people told us was impossible, couldn't be done. And we hired the first two engineers who told us they could do it. <laughs> then, after that, we were like, hey, this is, this is working. We returned to profitability at the end of 2008 after we launched this. It was initially called uh, Linkscape. And we tried to raise money again because we thought, hey, we're, we've got a nice trajectory here. And we failed. And then we failed again. And then we got a term sheet in 2011 during a fundraising attempt. And they backed out of, our investor backed out of the term sheet about three weeks uh, before close. So we failed again. Uh, that was a really sucky process. I've written about it a number of times. If you are interested in reading about someone who can't close a round to save their life, uh, you, can, you can check that out. Actually, that's not entirely fair because I, I bet if our life depended on it, we would have just taken a really, really crappy deal. And so the positive thing was, since we were profitable, which, by the way, is very weird. Like, it's very, very weird. If you look at any SaaS company, most of the companies that go IPO, they haven't been profitable at all in their history. They've always been losing money, but they have kind of the right metrics, right? Customer, high customer acquisition costs, but a long lifetime, so eventually that pays off. But in order to acquire more customers, they have to spend lots of money. Um, Moz is weird. I'll talk about our model uh, in a minute. This is actually, yeah, so I took, I like to take pictures to document things. Um, I, and I also like to uh, screenshot emails from VCs and then put them on the blog. They don't like that so much, which I don't, I don't quite get. I mean, why not? Um, in fact, when we tried to raise money again in 2012, uh, that came up a couple of times. I remember on, I was on the phone with a guy from Excel, and uh, he was like, yeah, we, 
your blog post was really interesting, but we don't want to appear in anything more like that. So bye bye. Okay, well, that's exciting, fun. But Excel's not so bad. They invested in has offers, which is a local startup that's that's really awesome. So I give them credit for that. And finally, finally, we found the love of our life. Well, two loves of my life. That's Brad Feld from Foundry and uh, my wife Geraldine. We just had dinner at Oak in uh, Boulder, which is awesome, but very noisy on a Friday night. Um, and <laughs> I love this. This is uh, Sarah, our COO. As soon as the money got deposited, she sent this image around the company on all staff, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Holy crap, 20 million in the bank. Um, I think I emailed Brad and said, we're already stocking up on caviar and panda meat. And that was, he enjoyed that. He's, he, he's an awesome guy. He's our kind of guy, which, which really worked out. He shares our values, our sense of humor. He's, he just, he's very invested in the long term, not the short term. Uh, so that was a great round. We raised uh, $18 million last April, 15 from Foundry, three from Ignition. You can read about it on our blog. And if, if, if you'd like, you can actually see a breakdown of, I know you're not supposed to put this data out, but I don't care. Uh, so there's a pie chart of who owns what in the company. I think my mom and I both own uh, about 24.5%. And then Brad and Michelle from, from Foundry and Ignition own 15 and 18% respectively. Uh, and then there, the rest is uh, common. And oh, and Kelly owns, or Kelly and Adrian own like one and a half percent. Should have been two and a half percent. Come back to bite them in the butt. Um, this, oh, there it is. Look, I even included it. What do you know? I'm smart. Uh, so from the first call with Brad, I had a call with him that was basically uh, me reaching out. Because so the, the way I know Brad is that. Amy, Brad's wife, subscribes to Geraldine's blog, travel blog, and was like a huge reader of that. And so um, whenever Geraldine complains about or, or worries that her blog doesn't make money, I'm like, baby, you made $18 million last year. Like, don't sweat it. You're good. It's cool. Um, the, uh, the first call to the deal term settled, and essentially this is like a term sheet, you know, a signed term sheet, and, and Foundry doesn't back out of those things. A week and a day. A week and a day. I went, I had a call with him. I flew to Boulder the next Friday. And that Friday night, he's like, we're in. That was it. It was, it was incredible. And then to close was, was almost as easy. We, you know, they have like their, the lawyers and the people who investigate, you know, who do all the, what's that called? Due diligence stuff, right? Who come into your office and they like talk to your staff and go through financials and blah, 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 blah. And I remember it was, uh, it was about a week and a half in. And Brad was like, what's taking so long? And Sarah explained, you know, they, they're, still, they're still working. And he's like, well, I'm tired of this. I want to close the round. Well, you know, the, and his lawyers and due diligence folks were like, hey, we're not done with our work. And he's like, well, do whatever you can by Friday. That's when the money's coming. <laughs> that was it, right? Like, it was just, it's mind blowing. Working with them has been incredible. So uh, You've got here kind of a picture, a, a historical picture of revenue. So you can see we were still doing consulting, 2007, 08, and 09. And our, as our product revenue sort of scaled up uh, over the years, we just we dropped that entirely uh, in 2009. And you know, have had a number of, of really nice growth years uh, over the past few. It's been it's been pretty exciting. And and because of that, um, we can do all sorts of fun stuff that revenue lets you do, like hire lots of people and uh, rebrand and launch lots of products and spend, we spend ungodly amounts of money. I think we spend uh, three quarters of a million dollars with Amazon. Well, we were every month, every month to keep our uh, data running. It turns out that if you try and process a web index on Amazon, they have lots of faulty boxes that fall over all the time, which is fine for storage because uh, and serving because they have redundancy. But if you're processing something and a box goes down, you have to restart from the last save point. So it takes, it's just horrible. Anyway, we, we're, we built our own private data center this year and we're moving all our stuff over to that. And those boxes, it turns out, run great. And so when we saw that Amazon was like reducing their costs you know, by uh, a factor of 10, we figured, oh, they have a bunch of faulty boxes that aren't working for their stuff anymore, so they're gonna sell them on EC2. SOBs. Um, I, I don't have, I'm, I've been very frustrated with them. The other thing I don't like is that their, uh, th their refunds come out of their salespeople's commissions, 
which I think is a terrible structure because it makes them very unincented to give a refund when there's bad service. Um, really sucks. Anyway, uh, so Spencer did ask me to talk a little bit about our rebrand. We rebranded from SEO Moz, which was originally the, the blog that I started way back in 2003, which was on a .org, right, SEOmoz.org, because it was just a blog. It didn't make any money, uh, and it became a business over time. But we rebranded to Moz, um, and luckily got the Moz.com and Moz.org websites, um, and the Moz Twitter account, which was very generously given to us by um, the former mayor of Voxholm, Sweden, who owned it. Um, really awesome. He came out to Seattle, and like we hosted him, and it was really fun. <laughs> he, was, he was super nice. And you know, when you do a Twitter transfer, right, you have to be there, like, waiting, because there's no. There's no process, right? So he releases the account, and then like you have to grab it right away. Because if someone's checking it right then, you could be up a creek. Um, at, and if there's questions about the rebrand, I'm, I'm happy to talk through them. The, the big story, you know, the big reason behind that is not that we're giving up on SEO at all, but just that we do a lot more than SEO. And SEO itself is much bigger than just doing SEO, right? If you want to be good at SEO today, you've got to be great at content, you have to be great at social, you better have a great community. Uh, you certainly are going to need user and usage data signals, which means having a great user experience. So it's just a much bigger field than SEO itself. Also, good luck hiring software engineers with SEO in your name. They do not have a high opinion of SEO. This makes it very tough. If you've ever been on Hacker News, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our vision and values at Moz. So we have kind of this framework that we go through, and that you don't have to read all of it, but the idea being, or our specific ones, but the idea being that we have some, some reason that we exist. Why are we here? It's bigger than just to make money. In fact, if we were just here to make money, A, I think we'd make less money, and B, uh, I don't think it would be very fun to go into work, um, nor would I be really excited about getting out of bed in the morning. And that sort of leads to two big things that we have over the next few years. The first one is our our strategic vision, how do we accomplish this purpose? How are we gonna accomplish this purpose over the next five to 10 years? What's our, what's our big goal? So we have um, you know, a big, hairy, audacious goal. And those, that acronym is not particularly nice. I don't really love BHAG, but uh, it is a good descriptor. The individual words are, are good adjectives. And then we have sort of strategic initiatives, things we're doing at Moz that, that matter to try and accomplish those. And out of that comes all the tactics, the things that we do. And infusing all of this is our core values, right? The architecture behind our decisions, why we do things. So I'll, I'll give you what ours actually are. Um, and then maybe, Amy, you can tell me later what Zillow's are. That'll be fun too. So we exist to help people do better marketing. Most marketing sucks. If you watch television commercials or surf the internet or uh, try and walk down the Pike Pine Corridor, marketing sucks. It sucks so bad. <laughs> And that these crazy high customer acquisition costs when what we really want is things that we want, right? We, we want to be sort of inbound marketed. Don't market to me until I tell you that I'm interested in something or I decide that you're doing something interesting and I follow you or check you out. That's, that's my kind of marketing. Our strategic vision is to power the shift. We, we believe there will be a shift from interruption to inbound marketing uh, over the next five to 10 years. And our big, hairy, audacious goal is to have a million paying subscribers to our software uh, on May 29th, 2018, uh, five years from when we launched Moz, rebranded re as Moz. Um, and then we have a number of strategic initiatives, which I won't necessarily get into, but I will uh, talk a little bit about our values. So this is, this is sort of how we put, how we think about uh, values, the big thing the big important thing about values is you have to believe in them more than you believe in doing things that will make more money or acquire more customers. That's very, very hard to do. Um, and in fact, Spencer and I have had conversations about how insanely hard that becomes once you go public and have kind of the street, you know, ha having all these demands. And you just have to have incredible amounts of discipline and long-term vision and a great board and great investors uh, in order to do that. I like this quote because especially this credo that we have our core values because they define for us what we stand for and we would hold them even if they became a competitive disadvantage. So this, 
this ties back to a story that I just told you about fundraising. We are transparent at Moz because we believe in transparency. It has also helped us with some marketing, but it's hurt us too. Remember that call with Excel? That wasn't the only VC who said, I don't want to show up on your blog. And my, you know, my response is, hey, we're a transparent company. If you don't believe in that stuff, you're not going to work out well, right? Like the board is going to become a very frustrating entity driving bad things um, and conflict. So our core values, uh, tag fee. Transparent, authentic, generous, fun, empathetic, uh, and exceptional. By the way, the one in here that's non-obvious is exceptional. When we say exceptional, we don't necessarily mean really, really good. We mean the exception to the rule. If everybody else is doing things one way, we don't want to do them that way. Um, you can see this. It's sort of the Portlandia thing, right? If a restaurant has more than two locations, I don't eat there. It's, it's not entirely, not entirely true. I will occasionally go to a chain, right? But like, I, I, I'm such a nerd for like finding stuff that nobody else is doing, and I think that's actually been hugely valuable and strategically advantage, uh, advantageous for us. Some company culture. So, so I am not a fan of most of the articles on company culture. When people write stuff about company culture, especially the, the, like the tech, press, and media, this is the crap that they write about. Oh yeah, you know we have karaoke nights and beanbag chairs and catered lunches and cruises and those are. That's still up. <laughs> <laughs> but these are these are perks. Right? These are, these are perks. And these are all things that we've done and things that we have and things that are fun, but they're not culture. They might be elements or outcroppings that are representative of what your culture actually is. But I really think about culture as being these few things. Right? The, mission, the shared mission and vision, the values. The values, by the way, might be different. The actual values at many companies are very different from the ones you put on the wall. That is, I mean, that's a sad thing. I, I hate that, and I've been working incredibly hard as we scaled up to try and make sure that tag fee stays our values, not just the ones on the website and the wall, but also the ones that we actually believe and represent. Uh, and there's a number of things that we've done around that, including tying our reviews to tag fee and uh, having interview screens that are all around tag fee and uh, other stuff too. It's also who you choose to hire, who you choose to let go, and why. That's, that's a big part of, of values. And then finally, what you define as cultural fit. So I hate the, you know, there's all these articles out there about cultural fit being uh, Star Wars or Star Trek. Do you go rock climbing? Because we all go rock climbing. Stop. Like, this is horrifying, right? This is, I mean, it's essentially ways to bias to get only people who are like you, which is very, very, very bad, right? Uh, you can see, for example, in, um, in public companies, boards that have uh, no women on them, comp those companies underperform dramatically to boards that have uh, gender representation, right? And uh, same story with uh, uh, racial representation. If you have, basically, if you have all old white guys, like the, you know, the Wall Street thing is going to happen to you. You just, um, <laughs> nothing against old white guys. I'm, they're fine, and some of them are very nice, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> it's gonna get in such trouble. That's what? That's still up too. <laughs> I mean, one day I will be an old white guy. It's just there's there's no denying. My beard is already showing it. It's just gonna happen. Uh, this is what uh, this is one element of Moz's culture, company culture that I did want to share with you because I think it's it's really interesting and and fascinating. So we have. Basically two tracks, this is split into four, but we basically have two tracks. We have a people wrangling track, management, right? People who, whose job it is to manage other people. And then the three of those, which are essentially just splits by function of individual contributor tracks. And one of the things that we believe in really strongly is that you don't have to have people reporting to you to move up, you know, to earn promotions, to get more responsibility, uh, to have higher amounts of influence and to have a higher salary. And in fact, we have people, plenty of them, who are higher on these tracks, whether it's in, in marketing, uh, in product, 
in uh, customer service, in um, uh, which we call it operations or engineering, who report to people that are junior to them. And I actually love this. I think this is a this is a it's a beautiful weird and different framework. So Google kind of has this, and so does Microsoft for their engineers specifically, but only for their engineers. And I don't I don't get it. If it's good enough for people who code software, why is it not good enough for people who acquire customers or people who design products or whatever it is. It, this is something that I'm very passionate about. And I actually, you guys will have a copy of this slide, but you can see sort of the, the elements that I've got in here, right? The individual contributors have some different responsibilities than people wranglers. Um, I'm, I'm actually not a huge fan of people wrangling myself. I recognize that I'm technically a CEO and supposed to do some of that. But I don't, things that I do not love, budget requests and approvals, <laughs> team organization and structure, it's not, it's not emotional health of the team. Like I, I actually get really, uh, Geraldine likes to say, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I really do. So at Moz, one of the challenges is your CEO will be here, and then here, and then here, and then here, depending on how things are going. And it can be kind of tough, right? Because people feed off of, of your emotion as a, as a manager, as a leader. And so I, I actually stood up in front of our company and in all hands um, recently, kind of in a room like this. Not as nice of you, uh, and you know, told folks that that keying off my emotions is a, is a tough thing. It's going to be a tough thing, and I wouldn't recommend it. Right? I'm not I'm not a super balanced like things are always good, positive, one line thing. And this has been feedback from the board that it's something I need to work on. This is just this is just who I am, and I I believe in authenticity, so I'm going to continue to authentically re represent how I feel. And then. The, there's sort of interesting stuff, right? As you uh, are more junior in, a, in an individual contributor role, you have less overlap with the things, the responsibilities that people wranglers do. But as you advance, right, as you get more senior, those responsibilities, you, you actually get more things, right? You get more into recruiting, big picture strategy, uh, mentoring other people, improving collaboration, that kind of stuff. And as, if you're more junior on the people wrangling side, you only have a couple of people reporting to you, chances are good that you're actually doing a lot of the work. I love doing the work. Oh, it's my dream to just like have a bunch of stuff that I need to get done and then do it. I just, I live for that, right? It's beautiful. How do we make the monies? <laughs> we, we do actually make some monies. Uh, so this is a breakdown. We have this internal tool called Gizmo. It does have a picture of the adorable little mop it from um, Gremlins. And, and sorry, I didn't screenshot that part. That logo's up here. But so it shows kind of a breakdown. And, and what's weird is you can see that, so this is our $99 price point, And actually, lots of people are grandfathered in at like $39, $49, and $79 a month. You can see that the vast, vast majority of what we do is serve 20,000 people who are paying us 99 bucks a month. And then, yes, there are people who are paying $199. I think this is $4.99, and then these are higher price points. Um, we don't do much of this. And in fact, people who are at these price points are often the people who are most frustrated with us because we don't offer things yet like multi-seat, um, which I know is something that's actually coming, or things like um, a dedicated account manager. We just, we just don't do it, and we're not going to do it. Because I love helping these people. I love helping them. I love helping, like, you know, uh, here at Zillow, I think Matt has got an account, one of your SEO guys, see here. Hey, what's going on, dude? Uh, so you don't have to answer now. Um, but <laughs> uh, right, but like Matt has a pro account, and I'm sure you would love to share it with people, and there's probably people who, right, multi-seed is something we should build. But you don't need an account, like you don't need to be able to call someone up on the phone and be like, hey, uh, yeah, my domain authority went down, and I really want to know what's up with that. You know what's up with that. Like, you're savvy and smart, and I, that's just not the kind of service that we want to provide, right? We really want to be self-service. And if you have questions like that, we should get them into the product. We should make it obvious. That's what, that's what the product should do. So that's sort of our, our weird bias. And we do customer acquisition mostly by having tons of people visiting our site for content and community, just as it has been for the last, oh my god, decade. Um, 
and then, yeah, so let's see, what is this? Uh, 3.4 million visits. I know, which is like, we get that every day at Zillow. But <laughs> for a B2B SaaS marketing company, it's like mildly impressive. Um, <laughs> we say mildly, emphasis on the mildly. Um, and then this is our actual customer funnel. So this is part of Gizmo as well. And you can see here, right, that 11% uh, of people who visited the site uh, actually made it to the product section. 12% uh, of those made it to the conversion page. 28% uh, of those uh, entered the cart. And uh, I'm sorry, got into a free trial. 50% of those vested, meaning they, they completed their free trial and kept paying us. Uh, we had 53% of folks who were in month zero to three get to month four, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we can sort of see what our funnel looks like at any given time for any given date range. And then there's some weird things about our funnel in particular, including on average it takes someone about seven visits to Moz's website before they take a free trial. If, if they visit us more than seven times and then they take a free trial, they tend to be a better customer. They stay with us longer, which is, interesting. If they come and visit only once or twice and then they sign up for a free trial, they tend to be a less qualified customer. They actually tend to quit much sooner in the process. So the thing I don't want is someone typing in SEO tools, click on you know, our result, come to the page, sign up for a free trial, quit in two months. Doesn't, it's not very good and in fact that happens a lot. What I really do want is them coming, reading the blog, checking out Whiteboard Friday, reading the Beginner's Guide to SEO, consuming a bunch of content, getting into the community, starting a, an account, commenting a bunch, and then signing up for a free trial. That is a great customer for us. Um, and so therefore, you can kind of feel this if you go to the Moz site, we don't do a lot of selling. In fact, there are people who for years described SEO Moz. When I got on stage to speak at their event, they'd be like, it's a wonderful free resource for uh, SEOs, and um, I think it's part of a, you know, they're like, how are you guys funded? Turns out we do have a product. You've probably just never seen it because you've been to our site a bunch and never, never found that we have something to sell you. This also speaks to the fact that I hate selling. Um, of our traffic, about 15% uh, of our free trials touch a paid channel, meaning something like um, uh, you know, retargeting. Actually, no, retargeting would be excluded from that, from touch. But um, uh, PPC, um, affiliate, uh, display, uh, those kinds of things. And then inbound SEO social content community, that's 85% of our free trials. Yeah, and our highest CLTV, customer lifetime value, comes from people who subscribe to our blog. If you're an email subscriber to our blog and you get your, our blog an email or you get it in your RSS feed, perfect. You're our person. All right, a uh, couple of lessons from Moz Marketing, then I'm going to wrap up and do QA. So for us, content is really the basis. It's like the, 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 base of the pyramid, it holds up all the things that we do. And that includes um, you know, our, uh, our primary blog. I also have a personal blog that I'm trying to build up. I get, you know, when I publish a post, I get like 800 to 1,000 people reading this. this these all have gotten 10,000 plus visits you know, the day they went up. Uh, so the, that blog is still a lot more popular. Um, we do a lot of different kinds of content. So we do videos. Have anyone in the room seen Whiteboard Friday? Seen a Whiteboard Friday at Moss? Cool, all right. Yeah, so video is uh, actually started as a very small channel for us and has become quite big over time. One of the things we do with Whiteboard Friday is it's sort of a marketing tactic that works really well, is we put it up on our site with one set of you know, keyword phrases that we're targeting. Uh, and, and that's with a Wistia video player. And then we put it up on YouTube, on our Moz YouTube channel, targeting a separate set of keywords. So for example, if there's a, let's say there's a, a Whiteboard Friday called the SEO's Guide to Building a Great Mobile Site, we would put a, uh, we might target the keywords um, uh, mobile phone SEO, right, on YouTube or some, something like that, probably something better than that. Um, we do a lot of investment in big content. So we actually have folks full time on the staff, this one's Dr. Pete, who put together kind of a, a, the Google algorithm history. This is a full history of all the named updates, all the things that Google has actually given names to or called out as, yes, we did make this change. Um, 
it, fascinatingly enough, we also run a project called MozCast, which is Dr. Pete's. And MozCast is sort of a uh, temperature daily weather report for how much Google has changed. So we look at a, a large you know, breakdown of keywords, I think 10,000 or so uh, different keywords on a daily basis, track them every day and see the fluctuation uh, that Google's having. And so we'll, we'll occasionally see like, hey, this, you guys had a major update. And they'll say nothing. And then they'll have a minor update, right? Something that changes the search results quite mildly. And they'll call, oh, we had an update today. We released this thing. And you're sort of like, well, you, yeah, you guys are kind of full of it. We, it's a really good thing that someone's keeping on top of this who is not you. Because y'all <laughs> can't be trusted. Um, which, you know, this is part of, part of Moz's mission of transparency is to help make Google fulfill their core values, even if they won't do it th themselves. Uh, <laughs> it's, right? Like, who's going to do that? And they're a huge company, and they have a massive influence over how, the, how things get found on the web. It feels like either, in my opinion, either they should say, we have changed. We have decided to be more like Apple, and secrecy is a value. Or they should actually live up to them. The hypocrisy is what really bugs the crap out of me. Um, so we. You, all that content that we produce, right, the big content pieces that take a ton of time and investment to produce, as well as the individual blog posts, social is really our amplification channel. When we push something out over Google+, which is actually quite a huge channel for us now, uh, Facebook and Twitter, it just goes, it goes huge. Um, we, we can get you know, hundreds of shares per post on Facebook, uh, hundreds on Google+, you know, dozens to hundreds of retweets. It's a very, very powerful channel. And you can see they've, you know, done a phenomenal job. Uh, our, our social team, social community team is run by Jen Lopez, our community manager, who's done a phenomenal job building up these channels, getting people to want to subscribe to Moz um, through a number of tactics that I'll, I'll talk about. E email is actually a big, big driver for us, too. We have something called the Moz Top 10 that uh, is 10 posts from around the industry, not not necessarily our stuff. In fact, we kind of have a rule that no more than two out of 10 can come from Moz. And the Moz top 10 is everything that a marketer would want to know that happened in the last two weeks in the web marketing world. Uh, it's been huge for us. I think it's got three or 400,000 subscribers uh, right now and pretty phenomenal open rates. One of the beautiful things too, when we, when we post this, you know, these folks who get 20, 30,000 visits from being you know, listed in the one or two position on the Moz Top 10 email, suddenly they're like, oh my god, Moz is amazing. I love them. They sent me 20,000 visitors. Like, they are in my heart. And that turns into future amplification, right? People who get mentioned here say, like, feel good about us and say nice things about us and, and have this great brand connection and association. It's really, really powerful to promote other people and then have them feel that, that sense of reciprocation and love. Uh, so we actually have been working on uh, defining our rules of marketing. These, these are not codified uh, today, but we're actually, we're, we've been kicking off that process. And this is a rough draft that we've started that kind of defines for us how Mazda's marketing works. So you know, the thing that we really want to do is help marketers succeed. Right? That drives all of our marketing efforts, not acquire customers, right? In fact, number two is education before conversion. We are trying to help people not to make them use our software. Uh, we're also big believers in quantity over quality. So like, you know, what BuzzFeed and HuffPo, Huffington Post, and, and a bunch of other these big media outlets have been doing, and in the tech press, right? TechCrunch has been doing this. Mashable has been doing this. Just publish. They just publish everything they can. And that you know, grows their traffic and grows their traffic. And we hate that stuff. Like we, we're big non-believers in that. Uh, so we try and have a great post every day and big content pieces that we work on. And if we miss a day because we don't have anything great, then we miss a day. It's OK. Make great stuff. Uh, we work really hard on mending broken windows. So I have a big broken windows theory around how community works on the web. If you go to YouTube, you too will devolve into a racist, homophobic, <laughs> sexist, bigoted, you know, just dick. Um, and, that, and that sucks. Like, so 
right, it, for our site, we try and curate that very carefully. We strongly encourage positive contributions, right? We have a thumbs up and down model, thumbs up, bubble to the top, kind of like Reddit, except not horrifyingly misogynist. Um, and, and we work really hard to curate what's said around uh, our world and what we deem acceptable and not, and you know, what we'll publish and that kind of thing. Uh, we do a lot of measurements, so we have a ton of data around uh, everything that happens. But number six, we try to invest a fifth of our efforts and our dollars and our time into stuff that we know is unmeasurable, but we think has serendipitous possibility. And this is actually proved quite valuable. So uh, I'll give you an example. It is impossible to go and speak at a conference or an event and measure the ROI. You can, you can try, right? You can do some things, especially if you're geographically central and you can be fairly confident that the rest of the people who are in that geography are, uh, who are at that conference are as well, although that's rarely the case. But really it's unmeasurable. And so you have to take this leap of serendipitous marketing faith. Um, and I like taking that leap on occasion. Uh, and then we, we like to promote great people, great content, great resources, regardless of where they come from. Our stuff, somebody else's stuff, you will hear me promote our direct competitors all the time. Um, I'll say nice things about Majestic SEO, which competes with us on the link graph side, or Raven Tools, which competes with us on a lot of the uh, social and search and crawl side, or um, Social Crawlytics, which uh, does a bunch of stuff with um, measuring social data on websites, or um, WhiteSpark, which does a lot of local citation data, which is something Get Listed competes with. It's just our model. That's how we work. So uh, with that said, I would love to do some q and I'm happy to answer questions about any of this stuff, from the, the funding to the entrepreneurship to the uh, building a business, company culture, marketing stuff, uh, anything you want. And as we've noted right here, if you are watching, you can text in 415-640-3255. Uh, and I assume you guys will get me questions that get texted in? OK, excellent. OK, I got a question. Hi. Uh, so can you just talk about your relationship with Google? Because it sounds interesting. Um, yeah. And then any opinions you have on Google, one of them in particular, do you think that they're unfairly using their advantage to promote their own properties? And, uh, and I guess yeah. the zinger is, should the government do anything about it? Uh, so I'll answer the last question first. Yes, they are using it to promote their products. I'm not sure whether it's unfair. Uh, one thing that's, that's a little frustrating is no one has a particular incentive to call BS on Comscore's numbers. So the way that Google gets out of being declared a monopoly here in the US is they say, we have 65% market share, and Bing, Yahoo, AOL, and Ask have the other 35%. We're really not a monopoly. And anyone can go anywhere, to, you know, can just go use another search engine anytime they want. That, that's not the definition of monopoly. We're not locking anyone in. But it's not actually true, and Google knows it. Uh, so the real percentage of share, market share, that they have in the US is about 90%. Uh, however, Comscore can't measure a ton of that. And Comscore miscounts because they use internal search. So if you go to MSN Autos and you look for um, uh, Chevrolet or, or a specific car, the, I don't know, what's the, whatever the new Tesla is, that's count, the Volt, yes, thank you. Um, I don't own a car, you can tell. The, <laughs> you can, Comscore will count that as a search for Bing because it's on the Microsoft network of sites. Google's network of sites is Google, right? They don't have a ton of content. They don't have a ton of like properties, other properties. They, they have nothing like the MSN network, um, nor do they have, you know, Yahoo has a huge media uh, uh, system. If you go to Yahoo's uh, news site and you do a search for, um, you know, celebrity X, Macklemore, right? That's a search that counts for Yahoo. And, Go and Comscore is aggregating all of that. They also can't measure mobile search, where Google has like a 98% uh, share. And so hence, it's very, it's very uh, in their favor to say, yes, the Comscore numbers are right. And of course, if you're Microsoft, you don't want to say, oh, man, we only have 10% market share, <laughs> right? Or like five, right? You want to say, we have 30% market share. No one at Microsoft has the incentive to fight against that either. Hence, 
these numbers exist out there inaccurately. If you want to see real numbers at any time, you can go to StatCounter, gs.statcounter.com. They uh, record 3 million websites' actual traffic through their analytics, and they'll show it. Um, in terms of our relationship with Google, it's shockingly good, actually. People from Google come in and give talks at Moz. They um, will film Whiteboard Fridays with us. I constantly needle them about the things that I think are, are not good, and they, you know, they give me a hard time about their stuff, too. It, it's actually quite a good sort of friendly, positive relationship um, and a, help, you know, a little bit of healthy tension, but a lot of good friendship, too. Uh, and we, you know, I would say we're more friendly with some teams than others. So Google Analytics team has been awesome to us. And Avinash Kaushik, who was their evangelist and now uh, is higher up and runs a bunch of other stuff, um, is also a, a close friend and spoke at MozCon. And um, yeah, I think the team that probably we have the most tension with is web spam. And that's because, well, historically, that was because we would often uh, illustrate the exploits um, of how people were manipulating Google with, with, the, with the hope that they would take action. But I think they didn't really like the fact that we were showing that they needed to go to work. <laughs> Uh, this is a text in question. Uh, talk to us about the challenges transitioning your business from a consulting organization to a product organization. Yeah. So it helps that, I think it helps that we sucked at consulting. Not that we sucked at it. We were, how do I put it? We sucked at scaling a consulting organization. Um, meaning there were, I think, five of us at sort of the height of our consultancy. And is the, this person's on the video. Yeah. I'll just look at one of the cameras. Hello. Um, and and uh, the, you know, the challenge really became that we had all these you know, thousands of people visiting our website and consuming uh, Moz's content, SEO Moz's at the time. And yet, our, I mean, our conversion rate was terrifyingly bad, right? So let's say 100,000 people in a month back in you know, 2006 were visiting the site. Maybe we'd get two new clients that month. Maybe one, right? So our conversion rate was just, was just awful, and, and we realized that, which is why we sort of launched the product. The tough part was, if you go back to that time, right? You go to 2006, you look at the five people who are employed at Moz, there's one of us today. It's just me, right? So my mom, you know, my mom exited the business fully um, in last year when we did our fund funding round. Um, and that whole thing was really tough. You know, the, the family dynamic inside a company dynamic is really hard. Just, just no fun at all. Um, the, uh, the other folks who were with us didn't, you know, didn't make it through that uh, conversion very well either. So for those, of you, you know, for those of you who might have or people who you know have a consulting business and they'd like to productize it, um, I don't have a, a ton of great advice for how do you you know, transition and transform those folks. For us, it was sort of a process of losing a lot of them along the way. Yeah. Um, how is it for you hiring in Seattle? Mm -hmm. And just sort of what are your thoughts on being based in Seattle versus the Valley? Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff around um, Seattle versus Valley. So I, I'm on a board in Silicon Valley, and so I get to see a little bit of, kind of company life there. That, I know it's not for me, right? Culturally speaking, there's definitely a, a much bigger focus on um, that kind of, it's a good way to put it, an empathetic way to put it. Um, it's a little bit more bulldozery. In fact, it's a lot more bulldozery than Seattle. And that's just not, that's not my personal style, right? So it's kind of a, look, the end goal is we need to build a, whatever, a billion dollar company. We're, try, you know, we're trying to return a 10x to our investors, that sort of thing. And that's the, that almost feels like it's the core purpose at, at many of the companies down there and for many, you know, for many of the startup founders down there. Um, it's weird to me to read you know, there's a very popular article on uh, Hacker News kind of making its way around about this guy who was talking about the, um, the harshest advice that Paul Graham in the Y Combinator program had ever given him. And he said that, you know, he was really passionate about building something that his mom could use. And, 
but he and his co-founders and, and sort of the Y Combinator network were like, well, it's a lot easier to build a big company in the B2B software realm. And so they, they went that route, right? That was, the, the article was all about how they, they shifted and went that route, and that was just very strange to me. Um, so I think attitudes there are quite different. Uh, the other thing, you know, uh, well, a bunch of other things. So obviously cost of living, cost of uh, housing, cost of office space, those things are all very helpful here. I think a, you know, a $1.1 million round like we did in 07 went as far as four or five million dollars would go in a round in the valley, uh, maybe even further. Salaries here are certainly, um, you know, 20 to 30 percent lower and, and dramatically so for the highest levels, right? So for sea level folks, um, you, you know, in Seattle, I've had phenomenal executives making very low six-figure salaries very low six-figure salary still being an incredible amount of money, in my opinion. Like, you can do so many amazing things with $100,000. But, you know, in the Valley, it, you know, a quarter million dollars is like, well, that's kind of the starting base point for a lot of those folks. And so it just means that your, your company costs are, are dramatically different. Um, there's also, I, I don't actually believe in the hours, and, and I hear this all the time, right, that, oh, man, the, you know, this is the kind of person who goes home at 8 or 9 p.m. We, where are the 2 a.m.ers? Where are the people we really need? Like, who are the hard work? And I had exactly that look on your face. That you, I was like, <laughs> do you, so I, like, I, I will work until 2 a.m., but that's because from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m., I'm having dinner and watching, you know, Dexter and, right? Like, I haven't caught up on a lot of things, so please forgive me for being like way behind. I'm in the first season, it's embarrassing. Um, don't tell me what happens. <laughs> uh, but the, I think that attitude is actually fundamentally flawed and wrong because A, you burn people out really quickly, but B, you also have this idea that, that the Valley's gotten and been written about a bunch that you're, what you're doing is trying to concentrate a 30 or 40 year career into four or five years, right? I'm gonna work as hard as I would have worked over my whole adult life to make the money like in just a few years. And that happens for so few people, it's just a, it's just a myth. And after about hour 50 that I've worked in a week, like hour 50 through hour 80 that I might work in a given week, that is worth about hour zero to four that I would work in a week. And I think that's true for virtually everyone. There might be some weird statistical outliers, but you are not getting that much more done in those 20 or 30 hours. I, I think it's a very, very strange kind of culture that sprung up around that. Um, I also love hiring uh, older people and women. The Valley is like not into this. I don't, it's so, I don't know. It's very, very frustrating to see. Thank you for being so candid. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple I'm a little more too transparent. Text. Um, let's, are there any in the room before I move on to? OK, Lloyd again. So Microsoft, and what's your relationship like with them and Bing? Do you even pay attention to them? Do you just feel sorry for them? And do you, write, do you ever write any blog posts? Do your products work with them, or you just kind of ignore it? Uh, our products do work with them, um, in fact, and uh, we've actually switched over to using a bunch of the Bing API. So Bing, for example, Bing is really transparent about a bunch of things. Their speakers will get on stage and they will tell you that they are using Facebook data in their ranking algorithm and that getting more shares and likes will increase the possibility that you'll rank higher. You will never hear that from anyone at Google, even though it's true, right? So just really frustrating. And Google will always use some logic like this. Uh, we have declined to use the face and Facebook Open Graph API. Which, what Google is saying when they say that is, we crawl Facebook pages and we look at how many likes a given page has and that goes directly into our algorithm because we can crawl them. But they, they won't say it, right? And you can, you can see this by building some sophisticated models and, and looking at you know, correlation analysis and that kind of stuff and sort of reading between the lines over the years and testing. Uh, the, you know, in terms of being in Microsoft, so I'm a huge proponent of them gaining steam. I don't, you know, I'm, 
I don't see the possibility that someone like a DuckDuckGo could really transform the market and like take over. I hope that they could, but I, I, I'm really a proponent of anyone entering that market, building more market share, because I think monopolies are really bad for the industry. Um, Google hoarding knowledge and sort of owning uh, which things come up is, is very tough. If you've seen, you know, if you've done a search on something local, for example, Seattle Thai restaurants, you've probably seen, right, Google's got this, um, you know, their normal results, but then they have this black bar showing uh, what, what's called carousel results, right? And those carousel results are showing off four or five pictures of restaurants. And you really, you know, you really don't get to decide how people are going to consume information anymore. And the 10 blue links model is almost dead, right? There's, I think there's like 18% of the 10,000 results that we monitor every week for MozCast are classic 10 blue links. Everything else is some modification. So Google really gets to own all of that stuff. And they decide what all of us know if they have all that market share. And they also decide how marketing works and what data to take away. Keyword data, right? I mean, not provided basically makes your job and my job 10 times harder. And they say it's for privacy reasons, but if we pay them in AdWords, they'll give us the data. So what? there's no logic behind it. Anyway, I'm going to stop ranting a little bit about Google. I am a fan of Bing. I do like what they're doing. Um, Dwayne Forrester from Bing, who's here in Seattle, uh, speaks all the time, is on the um, Bing Webmaster Central team, uh, Bing Webmaster Tools team. Um, and I, I think they're, they're progressing the market a little, a little more, in a more tag fee way than Google is. So we have time for one more quick question, which I'm going to take from a text. Uh, Facebook graph search, what do you think yeah. about it? What sort of impact does it have on SEO? Um, so no direct impact on SEO other than it becoming a new channel by which thing, things and people and entities and uh, businesses can be found. I think where it's going to matter the most uh, is around, well, where it matters the most is around individual friend type of searches and activity kinds of searches. That's uh, what Facebook has really built their brand around. And I think that it's going to be tough for them to transform it in any other direction and make it more like a classic search engine. That being said, um, I do think that there's lots of opportunities to market on Facebook. The open graph search is not, uh, or graph search is not yet one of them uh, because it hasn't gotten a ton of adoption. It doesn't send um, much traffic internally at Facebook or uh, externally yet. I do think that as Facebook um, evolves, if they can be successful in building more of a, I guess, true search-minded uh, community around what they offer as opposed to a, I go there to look at the baby pictures that my sister-in-law just posted, they, that could be a more powerful channel. Uh, right now, the only way to influence it is really to be interesting on Facebook, right? To do more interesting things, build interesting pages. Um, there's not a lot of, you know, in classic Google sort of SEO, there's a ton that you can do uh, algorithmic wise. Facebook search is much more simplistic today. Rand, you've been an incredibly fun and smart speaker. Oh, Thanks for, thank for coming. Thank you.